philosophy and religion. Uh, we want to thank that school for offering us this forum today. Uh, this is also sponsored by the Inari's Project for Alternative Futures. And the Inari's Project uh, is mission is to create a forum for conversations, ideas, and initiatives that promote a future free of domination, exploitation, oppression, war, and empire to the fullest extent possible. A very modest goal. Inspired by the speculative fiction of Oregon writer Ursula K. Le Guin, the project seeks to bring together activists and scholars from the arts, humanities, social, and natural sciences who are writing, thinking, and teaching about the ideas and themes explored in her work. Gender, racial, and sexual justice, ecological sustainability, bioregionalism, left libertarian anarchist traditions, utopias and dystopias, alternatives to war, cooperative economic arrangements, and indigenous cultures and ways of knowing. Uh, I'd like to present my co-director in the Inari's project, Joseph Orozco. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all for coming today. Um, the way that we're going to proceed uh, here is uh, we uh, have a, a, a line open to Professor uh, Victor Vargas at the Universidad Latina de America, which is located in Morelia, Michoacán. And we will have a conversation with him about this topic. And so it's less sort of a formal paper presentation or discussion, but he wants to have a conversation to answer questions that you might have. What we've agreed to do is uh, I would provide uh, some uh, background and information about this topic, and then we can sort of discuss it. And so I have a few slides to sort of share with you, and also some background video to be able to talk about this issue of uh, blood avocados. Right, and so as a colleague of mine was uh, talking today, he said, blood avocados, when I first heard that, uh, it sounded kind of good because it reminded me of blood uh, oranges. And so I was wondering exactly what could be bad about blood avocados. <laughs> Perhaps the better way to think about this is conflict avocados. Right? The analogy is to blood diamonds. And so Esquire magazine in November of last year coined this term blood avocados to talk about uh, the situation going on in Michoacan. Right? So Michoacan is um, a state in uh, central Mexico. And it is uh, unique in the sense that it is one of the sole global producers of avocados. It has an enormous uh, uh, production of avocados. And in um, Michoacan, uh, they're called uh, Oro Verde, or Green Gold. It's a tremendous market. Uh, so almost 72% of all avocado plantations located in Mexico are located in Michoacan. So uh, almost all of the production of avocados from Mexico come from this one state. 80% um, of those avocados are exported then to the United States. So we have a very large uh, uh, import market for them, and most of them come from uh, Michoacan. And uh, to give you a sense of the, of the size of this market, uh, Haas avocados in the U.S. in 2012, the market for that was just about uh, um, uh, 1 billion U.S. dollars. So it's a very uh, lucrative market. I mean, we can sort of see the, the issue here. Uh, these are, uh, Mexico is about uh, a little less than half of the world exporters in avocado. And so it has a lot, one of the largest shares, sole shares of avocado production in the world. And in terms of importers of avocados, the United States is the largest, uh, has the largest uh, share, sole share. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the Netherlands right, uh, is both an importer and an exporter of avocados. But the idea is that Mexico and the United States are deeply uh, uh, interconnected in terms of this one particular market for avocados. Now, the reason that uh, the blood avocados issue has come has to do with uh, what started in 2006. In 2006, uh, the Mexicans elected Felipe Calderón to the presidency of Mexico. And one of the policies that Felipe Calderón enacted was to pursue vigorously the war on the drug cartels and decided that he was going to try to uh, uh, prosecute uh, leaders and to try to hunt them down and to limit the power of the drug cartels in Mexico. And uh, the view is, many analysts believe, that there had been an uneasy truce between the federal Mexican government 
and the, uh, the drug cartels to allow them to do business as long as they did not engage in overt uh, violence and warfare with one another or on civilian populations. Um, that sort of that sort of uneasy truce broke down in 2006, and what you started to see then was an enormous rise in violence, uh, fighting, infighting between the cartels, uh, uh, civilians caught in crossfire, and uh, uh, pitched battles between the federal government, federal police, and the drug cartels. Since 2006 to about 2014, it's estimated that the uh, amount of casualties due to this change in policy is on the range of somewhere between 50,000 to 70,000 people killed uh, because of the drug violence. What this map represents here is uh, the sort of spheres of influence of the different cartels. So there are different cartels that operate in different regions of Mexico for different markets. Um, and what we're looking at, uh, this is Michoacan right here. And the cartels that operate in this area uh, in 2006 was a group called La Familia Michoacana, uh, the, the Michoacan family. And then now, as I'll explain in a bit, is a group calling themselves the Knights Templar. Uh, so this is a, 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 a kind of a, a map to show the spheres of influence also into other territories, into Guatemala, for instance. <clears throat> now, we're talking here about Michoacan. And the situation is this. In 2006, the reigning drug cartel there was this group called La Familia Michoacana, which was this um, quasi-mystical, spiritual, religious group. Um, the leader of this uh, saw himself in terms of some kind of cult religious figure. And the idea was that the cartel uh, arose in some way as a way to protect the community of Michoacan from the other drug cartels. And so it would sort of corner the market in Michoacan, but at the same time protect the family of Michoacan. And the leader of this styled himself in some sort of, as some sort of cult leader. He actually produced his own Bible. Uh, folks who were inducted into the uh, organization were, had to go through various kinds of spiritual rituals in order to become members of La Familia. Um, but uh, in, I believe it was in 2009 or so, <clears throat> the leader of La Familia was taken down. There was a power struggle. And then another group that sort of off, broke off from La Familia formed, and they called themselves uh, Los Caballeros Templarios, the Knights Templar. Right? And this is obviously referring to this uh, uh, group of uh, crusaders, uh, Christian crusaders, uh, the Knights Templar. And this is a, uh, the sort of code book of the drug cartel. Right? And if you can see the image here, these are of uh, different uh, medieval knights dressed in the Iron Cross um, regalia. And the book uh, title here is The Code of the Knights Templar of Michoacan. And the quote here is sort of their motto is, this struggle is for your people, for my people, for ourselves and for future generations. So the Knights Templar uh, cartel uh, explicitly has mission statements. They talk about what they provide for the area is social justice. And that they're there to protect the community uh, and to provide assistance to them. This says, if there ever was such a social contract, this has broken down in the past couple of years, and that's part of why we get to this question of what the blood diamonds are, or blood uh, avocados are about. Um, to sort of give you a sense of the extent into which uh, the Knights nice Templar are involved in various kinds of actions in society or see themselves in part of social society, this is um, Melissa Plancarte. She is a, um, a, a pop singer from Michoacan. Her father is one of the six leaders of the cartel. And just earlier this month, she was in a bit of controversy because she posted this photo to Instagram, uh, trying to promote some of her latest albums. And uh, she explicitly wore the symbol associated with the cartel. Uh, and so uh, she, uh, promptly on Twitter said, uh, disavowed her father and said, I don't, you know, I love my father, but I'm not part of the cartel. I'm not involved in that. But nonetheless, 
uh, is quite happy promoting uh, herself in terms of the imagery of the cartel and the symbolism of the cartel. What started to happen in the past two, three years or so is the rise of what is called in Spanish the Ato Defensas, or the Self-Defense Committees. And this is a map of Michoacan uh, with various uh, uh, sort of counties or, uh, in, in the state. This area here in Michoacan, in sort of southwestern Michoacan, is called uh, Tierra Caliente, or the hot land. It's sort of a plateau mesa leading out to the sea. Now what has started to happen in these territories is that local citizens from villages have created these vigilante self-defense committees to fight back against the drug cartel. In many cases, what they are doing, as we'll see, is that the police are offering them no protection from the cartel in any kind of way. And so they feel desperate and feel that they have to take their safety and security into their own hands. And so what you've seen in Michoacan is uh, literally thousands of uh, villagers forming these self-defense committees. This here is the sort of power center of the Knights Templar. It's the city called Apatingan. Uh, the the uh, capital of Michoacan is Morelia. This is where Professor Vargas is at, is located in this area here. What this graphic represents is uh, territories now, presently, as we speak, controlled by the auto defense committees and territory controlled by the Knights Templar. And what you've seen here is that they have surrounded, in some sense, the stronghold in Apatzingan of the Knights Templar. This particular map leads some people to suggest that what has happened is that the auto defense uh, forces were not actually grassroots movement, but were being assisted by the federal government uh, to form as a security measure to encircle the uh, drug cartel in Michoacan. So there's, there's questions about where these folks started to organize, how they got their weaponry, and how they developed this kind of strategy to uh, work this. So there's all these questions. Uh, the Mexican politics is very complicated this way about under the table deals and secret conspiracies and what's going on exactly. But it does raise questions about sort of the strategic nature of the sudden uprising of uh, vigilante com uh, committees within the past year that have encircled Apatzingan. And there are, in some sense, two prongs to this auto defensas movement. There is the one that I'm sort of saying is, is located uh, around Apatzingan. This is Dr. Nerales, we'll see a video in just a second, who is the leader of one of these auto defense uh, committees. This is uh, a second movement uh, of indigenous people who are Purepecha in Michoacan. And they are located in the uh, uh, village of Cheran. These two movements, while related and similar to one another, have very, very sort of different bases in terms of their philosophical, political outlook. And so part of what we're going to do right now is I want to show you a couple of short videos uh, about both Dr. Morales and then also what's going on in Cheran. And then we can have our conversation with uh, Professor Vargas. So let me uh, douse these lights so that we can... As drug violence grows in Mexico, some citizens have decided to take the law into their own hands. Over the past 10 months, dozens of communities have formed vigilante groups who've declared war on local drug cartels. <laughs> While the number of drug-related killings has decreased in Mexico over the past two years, kidnappings increased by 25% last year. The Mexican government is doing little to prosecute these crimes. In the fertile valley of Apatzingán, lemon farmers and cattle ranchers were so fed up with being taxed by local drug dealers 
that they formed vigilante groups to run out the drug cartels. To understand what made these regular folks fight back, we visited three towns in Michoacan State. Our first stop was La Ruana, a town of 40,000 people that rebelled against the Knights Templar cartel earlier this year. And what people are doing here to defend themselves, they set up these barricades made of this earth, and uh, they're checking the cars that come in and out because they want to check for any suspicious activity, anyone they don't know, they stop them and they register them. As you enter La Ruana, you can see the remainders of a chapel built by cartel members to honor one of their fallen leaders. The homes of local cartel bosses are still standing, and they give you a hint of the eccentric lifestyle some of them led. So the guy who lived here was a local boss for La Ruana, for the Knights Templar, and his name was Manuel Oroz Cureña, alias Culo Bajito. Pretty funny nickname. Hipólito Mora is the leader of the local self-defense organization. He talked to us about life under the Knights Templar. <laughs> Carniceros, aquí hay unas carnicerías, les cobraban de 700 a 1000 pesos por cada bate que mataban. Y al negocio principal de ellos era la extorsión. Les dejaban más que, que la droga. Mora's armed men managed to chase cartel members away from the town in February. It's no easy task if you consider that the Knights Templar are currently the most powerful cartel in Michoacán, with earnings of at least $75 million per year according to a recent intelligence report. <laughs> Mora says that with the help of a new army garrison, his men have been able to repel several attacks from the cartel. Thanks to Mora and his group, La Ruana is safe now. Businesses here no longer have to pay taxes to the cartels. But danger still lurks nearby. Going to a town called La Loma, where there was apparently a shootout yesterday between the Knights Templar and the local people, and the people there have uh, created their own vigilante group now. In this town, men with AK 47s shot at the home of cattle rancher Alberto Marana in the middle of the night while he slept here with his family. He showed us the bloodstains left there by a relative who was shot during the attack. The residents of this town say they can't rely on the government to protect them. The attack on Magana's home prompted them to form a self-defense group of their own. In the nearby town of Tegat Batepec, sexual abuse prompted locals to form their own vigilante group. Cartel members here were abducting girls from the local school and raping them, while officials turned a blind eye. The resistance movement in this town is led by Dr. Manuel Mireles, the director of the local health clinic. Thousands of soldiers have been sent to Michoacán this year in an effort to restore order in this part of Mexico. But Dr. Mireles says that cartel attacks are still happening in the countryside because the army hasn't done enough to dismantle these criminal groups. The army's limited presence has helped to keep cartels away from some towns. But none of the vigilante groups around here are willing to lay down their weapons, as long as cartels still lurk in the countryside. People here know that they could be killed if cartels mount a successful invasion of their towns. But they prefer to keep fighting if it means living free from cartel rule. Fusion. But one is so clever that you...
the second video that I want to share with you is um, of uh, Chiran. <coughs> Una de las tradiciones culturales era, es la, la convivencia con el bosque atrás de, de, pues de los talamontes, pues está el crimen organizado. Iban saqueando, talando el bosque, pero también iban quemando. La pregunta es para qué quemaron, para qué quemaban, ¿no? Entonces no solamente pensaban en este... En, en, en saquear el bosque, sino apropiarse del territorio, apropiarse del territorio, y apropiarse del territorio llevaba la finalidad pues, de, de utilizarlo para cosas ilícitas, ¿no? como la siembra de nervantes y todo eso, ¿no? y forzosamente que atrás de ellos pues, están personas con poder económico, con poder político, y, y bueno, que son capaces de comprar incluso al mismo sistema de gobierno. ¿no? Nos dimos cuenta de que están involucrados en varias partes y dependencias gubernamentales. Y nos dimos cuenta de que pues, también la policía estaba ahí. Entonces nos enteramos que nos enfrentamos no solamente a una pequeña, a un grupo, sino a toda un, un, una organización criminal y nuestros comuneros que se atrevieron a hacerles frente a defender, a defender su territorio, su parte o su bosque, pues desafortunadamente fueron asesinados. ¿no? Entonces ese 15 de abril, en el que se organizaron un grupo de señoras, empezaron desde muy temprano. Los detuvieron a cinco talamontes ese día. E intentaron detenerlos por la buena, desafortunadamente, pues estos señores les echaron los carros encima, fue pues, cuando se encendió pues, la, la, la rabia, ¿no? tanto, tanto tiempo contenido, ¿no? provocó pues, el coraje, ¿no? detuvieron a esas personas y pues inmediatamente empezaron a tomar los carros. En cada esquina se empezó a tener un, una especie de barricada, pero con la idea de que ya no volvieran a entrar, ¿no? más bien era con esa idea de que no entraran los sicarios y que nos pudieran hacer daño, pedimos quién iban a ser los voluntarios y salieron muchos voluntarios que ya hoy conforman esta ronda eh, comunitaria. ¿no? Aquí este, tradicionalmente aquí la forma de protegerse era la ronda y, y le llamaban así la ronda que eran personas voluntarias de, de, de los cuatro barrios salían anteriormente salían a hacer la vigilancia entonces no inventamos nada solamente retomamos la forma tradicional de cómo se protegía antes de que aparecieran los policías pues para nosotros el policía pues es el que pone el gobierno ¿no? el que, y la ronda es la que surge del pueblo ¿no? Entonces, lo único que hicimos es recurrir a nuestra historia, recurrir a la, a la plática de nuestros mayores y que nos dijeran cómo lo íbamos a hacer para organizarnos. Solamente estamos retomando las formas como, eh, tradicionales de cómo estaba organizado nuestro pueblo y que daba el resultado y que no se manejaban partidos políticos y, y, y funcionaba, pues. Entonces creímos conveniente de que la ronda comunitaria tenía que jugar un papel dentro del al interior, pero también tenía, teníamos que buscar que, que no se siguiera saqueando pues, nuestro bosque por los vecinos, por los mismos este, sicarios, y era como el lugar donde se venían a, a saquear a nuestros bosques. Entonces creímos nosotros crear una... Un, una ronda un poquito más especializada 
sobre todo que conocieran nuestro territorio, ¿no? Que conocieran nuestro territorio y pues que en ese conocimiento de nuestro territorio, pues primero está la defensa y la protección de nuestros comuneros, ¿no? En esas áreas, en esas áreas, pero también tiene que ser gente que conozca, que sepa de campo, que, se, que, que esté capacitada pues para andar en el campo, ¿no? Entonces, esa es una, un, un, una ronda eh, especial para, para el campo. ¿no? Ellos tienen la, la identidad de ser comuneros y, y que protegen a nuestro territorio. La, lo referente a cómo nos, nos protegimos, pues las armas que tenía la policía municipal son las que utilizamos ¿tá? y son las que se siguen utilizando, este, esas, esas mismas armas, porque consideramos que son del pueblo y deben servir precisamente para la defensa del pueblo. Y cuando nos pidieron el, que entregase las armas que las entregaron, nosotros dijimos no. Entonces no vamos a entregar las armas porque son del pueblo y nos pertenecen. Nosotros dijimos que, que todo lo que se nos atravesara lo íbamos a hacer a un lado. Se nos atravesaron las elecciones y las hicimos a un lado. No nos interesaron las elecciones. Entonces lo único que hicimos es recurrir a nuestra historia, recurrir a la, a la plática de nuestros mayores, y que nos dijeran cómo lo íbamos a hacer para organizarnos. Y, y por eso siempre decimos que en el, en el pueblo hay, hay sabiduría, hay conocimiento, hay formas de organización. Aquí es donde deducimos que los políticos que a veces se dicen que son los que saben todo, los asesores, ¿no? Los verdaderos asesores, los del verdadero conocimiento están en el pueblo. De nuestro, de nuestro movimiento son tres, seguridad, justicia y la reconstitución de nuestras voces. that any avocados that you buy here in Corvallis uh, come from Michoacán, right? And so, that, as we see here, the situation there is one in which there's this intense violence going on between the drug cartels and uh, the producers, precisely about the produce that we are consuming. And so, a lot of people are starting to raise these questions now about what do we think about uh, what might be called conflict avocados. Uh, and so, uh, for that, I've invited uh, uh, my colleague at uh, UNLA in uh, uh, Michoacán to uh, talk a little about this and to answer any questions that you might have about this situation. So this is Professor Victor Vargas. He is Professor of International Relations at UNLA uh, and uh, also the Director of uh, uh, International Programs at UNLA. Uh, and so I will turn this over now to uh, his comments and any sort of questions that you might have for him. So, Victor. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Like Hello. Can you, can, you, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I would like to thank uh, Jose Antonio Orozco for this invitation and also Oregon State University. For me, it's a pleasure to talk with you guys and share uh, information about what's happening in Michoacán. I think it is important that if we analyze the self defense forces in Michoacán, the best way to do it is through an interdisciplinary approach. Um, in studying this uh, phenomenon, we have legal aspects, we have social, economic, uh, we have a multitude of uh, uh, elements present that make it fascinating and show us how dynamic, how uh, complicated this phenomenon is. 
And also, I'd like to make sure very brief comment about the title of the presentation today, Blood of Alcantara's Drug Cartels and the Crisis of Democracy of Mexico. I would like to recuperate that blood of Alcantara's can be related to the, how powerful the drug cartels became in Michoacán. And one of the forms of income is related to the extortion, not only of avocado producers, but many of the uh, farmers, everyone had to pay a tax or a fee for, uh, for, for a certain amount of produce they, they took out of the, of the farms. They would have to pay a uh, specific fee. Really, the drug cartels created a formal government in Michoacán, in certain regions of Michoacán. The drug cartels uh, controlled many uh, municipalities in Michoacán. There was no presence of the uh, real government or uh, government, uh, federal government or state government or municipal government. And this, has, uh, this can have uh, an impact on Mexico's democracy in two senses. It can be positive, it can make, make us think about our democratic system, it also shows us how people have become empowered. People have learned that they can do things. And now it's going to be very difficult to return to the past. But also it can be very negative, because we really don't know what is going to happen with these self-defense forces. They, in many countries, uh, these self-defense forces, vigilantes, paramilitary groups, have become uh, very violent. They have been related or they have taken the place of other drug cartels, and usually they have been against social movements. In many countries, like in Central America, uh, in South America, in Colombia, for example, these paramilitary groups were used to eliminate uh, uh, social leaders in rural areas. But I think it's a fascinating uh, uh, situation we're living in Michoacán. I think it has changed a little bit since where the, where the videos were, were, were made. And I think we're in a different phase right now. There is a alliance between the government and the security forces against the drug cartel, in this case, the night Templars of the Church. Go ahead with your questions or comments, please feel free. Yes? The, the videos we saw, the, the first one talked about uh, extortion, which I thought was kind of interesting that they moved, it, it said they moved from drugs to extortion, whereas the Sicilian Mafia moved from extortion to drugs. <laughs> that was interesting. But um, are, are you saying that the people, and they didn't say too much about avocados, but um, are they getting the money from the avocados through extortion, or are they actually owning the agribusinesses that are producing the avocados? When they would write your question, it's both. First they would, tax, they would uh, impose a tax or a fee for every ton of avocado making a farm. I think it was, uh, it was uh, two pesos for every ton. So they were uh, receiving income from what was being produced in the avocado farms. Also, the drug cartels were able to take away property from their original owners. They would, uh, they would open the go up to you and tell you I want your uh, titles, your poverty, and they will take over. So it's both. But this is interesting because the drug cartels, yes, they began with, uh, with trafficking in drugs, because Michoacán is a state that produces marijuana and uh, heroin, but it's also a transit zone. If you look at the map of Mexico, there's three routes for drugs and human trafficking. One is through the North Coast, the Pacific Coast, it goes through Michoacán, one through the center of Mexico, which goes directly into Arizona and Texas, and the other one through the Gulf, that will reach Brownsville uh, and uh, Atamoros. So but those are the three main terrestrial routes for drug trafficking that take um, that fall from South America and Central America. Yes, please. Um, I think it's a No. Yeah. There was a, a gap. <laughs> How many was it the drug cartel interfering with <laughs> but, but it's interesting because the drug cartels started with drugs, then they will learn to be involved in other activities. Extortion will be one, another uh, 
Also, they would be involved in warming, for example, they would warm uh, trailers transporting as the medicines, and then they would reach out the medicines. They would also be involved in human trafficking. They would also be uh, uh, involved in the black market, for example, of uh, cigarettes and alcohol. They would also be involved in, uh, in, in uh, exporting, for example, in the case of the Knight Templars, they were exporting iron ore to China. And this takes it takes us to another level, the complicity of the authorities that allow these groups to grow. This has not been an accident or something spontaneous. It's something that's been developing, and there was a complicity between the authorities at the municipal level, the state level, and the federal government. That is why you hear both in Chiran and in Terra Caliente, the main argument or justification is no one was defending us, so we decided to take uh, weapons and defend our family and our property. More questions? Yeah, um, what do you think is the best method to fight the drug cartels? It seems pretty um, infiltrated in every aspect of Mexico. I think it's a very complex. For example, Mexico, we face a very difficult situation. We're next to the biggest consumer of drugs in, in the world. So it is very attractive for uh, Mexico or to people in Mexico to become involved in the trafficking of drugs. I think it is very difficult to eliminate, eliminate uh, drug or drug consumption. For example, in Mexico, we're militarizing uh, the war against drugs, while in the US and different states, there has been uh, legalization of the use of certain things. So it's very uh, uh, paradoxical that in one hand, we ask other countries like Colombia and Mexico to fight the drug cartels, to fight drug uh, production and uh, drug transit, but in the US, the laws are becoming more flexible towards the consumption and use of certain drugs. The solution is very diff difficult to give a uh, one answer. For example, the case of the South African forces in place, I think it is important because they gave the Mexican government a, an opportunity for a new strategy. The old strategy of confrontation with the uh, drug hotels, military confrontation without working. The South defense forces, they know the region, they know who the drug dealers are, the drug cartel members are, so it's very easy for them to work with the authorities. But there's a huge question behind the, the self-defense forces. Who is behind them? How are they being financed? What are their main political goals? So there are different questions. The case of uh, Terra Caliente and Dr. Mireles, which you saw in the game, he is a, he's a physician. He's from the middle class. He used to work for the state government. And he decided to uh, start collaborating with the self-defense forces because of the abuses. Drug cartels became so powerful that what they originally were supposed to do, was Antonio mentioned, he said that they were going to defend the, uh, the people of Michoacan from cartels from other states, for example, the Centas, Tapolipas, or the part of Sinaloa, or Nueva Generación from Jalisco. They were there to defend the Michoacanos and the business uh, people. They became so powerful that they started doing what other cartels had done in the past. Extorting people, and robbing their property, uh, violating women, etc. Do you think the secular the, the secular way in which the drug cartels fight may lend itself to a dissolution of the Mexican state? In the near future. I don't think that, that, the, that the Mexican state is in jeopardy. It is a warning sign because many of what is happening in Peru, many of the things that are happening in Michoacan, is the, the, the disappearance or the disintegration of the state. But at the same time, with what is happening now, there is a strengthening of the state with what it is doing in Michoacan. Uh, 
I didn't understand very well your question about the secular part at the, the beginning. Could you repeat or clarify what you meant by the secular nature of the state? My question is, do, do you think that all these drug cartels and... Do you think all these drug cartels will eventually force Mexico to dissolve into, a, into smaller states? Um, because these groups obviously don't get along so well unless they're trading together. Okay. Este, I don't think that they, they will force the result in Mexico as such. I don't know if this last weekend the main leader of the cartels in Aloha was captured, the Chapo de Guzman. Este, in Michoacán, there is a struggle directly between the government and the South African forces against the White Templars. Uh, I think there's a recomposition of the different cartels, and that is one of the reasons why, with the political transition in Mexico from an authoritarian regime to democracy in 2000, the old structures or relationships between political power and the drug cartels disintegrated, and this generated a huge conflict between the different groups to acquire new territories or to acquire access to new territories. But I don't think that this, you know, Mexico as a state is in danger of disappearing as such. Thank you. Uh, Victor, I had a question about, um, you know, I think you mentioned that the one key difference from the self-defense groups in Colombia is with the, um, um, that they targeted, they eventually started killing people. Uh, the, what similarities you see with the Colombian experience, and what differences, and what do you think can be learned from the Colombian experience to avoid going down the same path? Well, I think that uh, in the case of uh, Colombia, they represent the very dark side of the paramilitary or vigilante groups. One of the reasons is that they will be formed in a very strange uh, alliance between drug cartels, businessmen, and uh, the government to confront, to confront the FARC or the guerrillas, in, uh, the left-wing guerrillas in Colombia. And the problem is that they were not only fighting uh, the, the FARC, but they also targeted social movements, social leaders. And this made it uh, very violent, very violent, in exterminating the social leaders. And today we're seeing that many of the members of the paramilitary groups uh, uh, are, are talking about the close relationship between the government and the paramilitary embassy in the case of Colombia. In the case of, of, of Michoacán, it is also it's important to mention that there are defense forces in 11 states of Mexico. Michoacán is not the only state. So people are organizing and they're standing up and fighting for their rights. In the case of, of uh, Michoacán, many of the leaders of these social organizations, community organizations, are people from the middle class. They are uh, professionals, with farmers, and the people you saw in the media, Dr. Menares, as I mentioned, is a doctor. The other leader of La Ruana, with the movement began, is a farmer. So these people had interested interests that have been their, their, problem, their findings have been affected. And what they are looking for, their final goal is to clean the state of Michoacan from the presence of drug entities. So I think there's a, a huge difference between what was being uh, proposed in the case of Colombia, the paramilitary groups, and the case of uh, the defense forces in Michoacan. And just a quick follow up on that, because you mentioned before that, you know, because the, the biggest drunk drug consume, consumption is just on the other side of the border. So the issue, because the, this drug trafficking will continue as long as there is demand for their consumption, right? So if we think that that's not going to go away, and the main premise of these uh, paramilitary groups, these vigilante groups, is to get rid of the drug cartels. If the drug cartels are not going away, does that mean that these forces, that this group will remain in the mid well, long term? Sorry for interrupting you, but in the case of Michoacan, that is why it is so important for the government 
to regularize or legalize these defense forces. The same thing happened in Chennai. In Chennai, the community forces are recognized by the government. They have, given, they have been given certain autonomy because they are an indigenous community, they are an indigenous municipality, so they have been allowed to form these, their own uh, security forces according to their traditions and, and their customs. In the case of uh, Tierra Caliente, which is in urban areas, larger cities, one of the main goals or the, one of the most important goals of the government was to regularize these uh, defense forces so they would not be outside the law and become paramilitary groups or vigilante groups as in other countries. But right now, for example, there are uh, the self-defense forces in Ukraine, there are self-defense forces in, uh, in other countries. There, we have them in Guatemala, we have them in Colombia, in Peru. So it's really, it's also an international, it has an international component. Another follow-up question. Um, with that, if you, you said that so the government is, tra is trying to legalize those groups. With yes. that, with that process, does that come some sort of support in weapons or training or how how, how do you see that? Yeah. There's a huge problem in Michoacan. The federal government has wanted to use or is using the self-defense forces as a, a way to confront the drug cartels. The state government has not wanted, has not, is not interested in working with the self defense forces. But really, they became a new strategy, a strategy, a new option for the government to to confront the drug cartels, not only in Michoacan but in other uh, regions of Mexico. Many of the self defense forces will become part of the police, or they will become community forces. But this, this will apply being trained, being given as the weapons by the government. One of the interesting questions is where do they receive their backing? One is from migrants in the U.S. Many people who left these communities are financing the defense forces in their hometowns. There is also mining companies that are interested in providing as the finance to these groups because they were affected in their mines or their investments in Japan. There's also other drug cartels that are financing these, these groups. So it's a very interesting but complicated mixture. And really to distinguish which uh, self-defense forces are really grassroots organizations or associated with another drug cartel, sometimes it becomes very difficult. Victor, I had a question. I was wondering, uh, do you think that is there any uh, concern about uh, human rights violations uh, with these uh, uh, self-defense forces? Has there been any sort of discussion about whether or not these are operating in, in within the force of the law, or are they operating in ways that might violate human rights? I think the, the question is very important, because when they emerged, they were equal. Were well, they represented as equal outside of the law? And here's where we talk about the failure of the Mexican, as a, the Mexican state, was unable to provide one of its basic functions, the security of its own population. So when these groups emerged, the first uh, question is that they were illegal, and they became a threat to the human rights of the, of the, of the general population of Chocan. This was one of the arguments that were used to try to discredit the self-defense forces. There is a threat that they could violate, or that they are violating human rights, they have not been trained, they have not, they have not, they have not known the legal system. For citizens that have, been, uh, that have acquired weapons and you know, protect their uh, property, their lives, their families, but they're also involved in a military campaign against uh, drug cartels. In the maps you uh, as Antonio presented, there was a military strategy of expanding and, and capturing or controlling New territory. They started in Buena Vista, they started in Tepacatepec, and it started moving towards the west. And what they were trying to do was to uh, circle the Patzingan, which was the main stronghold of uh, 
of uh, the Knight Templars. Once that they encircled Apatzingan, they captured Apatzingan. But it's the, there is a worry about them being able to weather human fights. We have time for one more question, if someone has a question or comment. Do you think American intervention will become necessary in the future? And if so, to what extent? I can hear your question, if you repeat it, please. Do you think that in the future, American intervention will become necessary? And if so, to what extent? I hope not. <laughs> no, it's very U.S. military intervention is not. I, I, I think, first of all, there has to be a political will, a commitment by the government to really fight against the drug cartels. The problem is the complicity between authorities, politicians, businessmen with the drug cartels. It's a very lucrative business. And many people are not willing to, to clarify or to fight against this perverse relationship with these actors. One of the biggest questions now is nothing is being done with the authorities, the politicians, the businessmen that were associated with the Night Templars. The same thing with the capture of the Chapo Guzman. While he has been captured, but there's no talk about his relationship with politicians, business, and, and not only in Mexico, but in other countries, because I think they had presence in more than 17 countries in the world. He had business partners, he had uh, investments in the US, Mexico, Asia, Europe. And if we don't talk about this relationship and what is happening. So I think uh, the, the main thing is the will of the governments to fight against uh, drug cartels, the drug trafficking. If we have the will of the governments, I think something can be done. But it really it's going to be very difficult to eliminate these, the drug consumption and drug trafficking in the world. So talking about these uh, blood avocados, um, does it make sense to uh, in the United States uh, to stop buying avocados or to mount a boycott of uh, blood avocados? I, I don't think so. The things have changed, uh, changed very much in the last two months. Many of the municipalities that were controlled by the, by the, by the drug cartels have been, uh, in quotes, liberated by the Force, security forces and uh, self-defense forces. People are uh, not paying taxes or are not having to pay fees. Uh, slowly there's a bigger presence of uh, government and government institutions. But the problem, to solve the problem, and uh, very many other things has, has to happen. And uh, one way to support the communities, the farm workers, etc., is by buying uh, avocados. And remember, they extorted not only the producers of avocado, they extorted uh, people who produce of cucumber, papaya, este, mango, anything you can imagine, you had to pay a fee. For example, you, they would call you and you would be at a business, a computer, a, a internet cafe, you would be called and you would have to pay a, a fee for, for your business. And also, looking at the big picture, the drug cartel, the night first, created a huge structure to control society. They provided uh, a judicial system. You had, uh, if you had any legal claims for someone who did not pay a debt, you could go and talk to them, and they would be, surely enough, they would get your, your, your money. Surely enough, you would be, have to pay a percentage of the money they recuperated. If you have uh, alimony payments that were, were not being paid, they would talk to the person that you would become uh, current in his payment. So there was not only a judicial system, there was also a political structure. Many politicians were controlled by the drug cartels. Drug cartel would uh, provide money, financing for campaigns. So it was a very, very interesting structure that was created by the Night Templars. All right, um, so uh, uh, we're out of time here. I want to thank you, Victor, for your time uh, uh, with us. And you go ahead and hold on, and I'll, uh, I'll talk with you in just a little bit. Uh, but uh, let's thank uh, uh, Professor Vargas for his time with us today.